Welcome to the Hey Chaplain podcast. My name is Jared Altick, and I'm a chaplain with the police department. This podcast exists so that cops can hear encouragement from other cops. Even if you never talk directly to a police chaplain, I'm hoping that you might listen to a chaplain talk to other cops about being a wiser, healthier person. On this podcast, you'll hear from dispatchers and federal agents, sheriffs and U.S. Marshals, as well as the occasional detective from Kansas City. From the LAPD to Scotland Yard, the guests on Hey Chaplain are giving you the wisdom gleaned from their experience so that you don't have to learn the hard way. Naturally, I think that every cop should listen to every episode of Hey Chaplain. But this one? This episode is really important. It's about leadership and integrity, corruption and gaslighting. It's about a type of dishonest supervisor who can destroy the culture of a police department and then walk away looking like the only hero. Warren Wilson calls that character a Munchausen manager, and he wrote an article about it for Police One, which is how I found him. Listen to this episode, read Warren's article, and pass this on so that everyone will have the vocabulary to explain the odd behavior we sometimes see. Here's Warren Wilson. Hello, Warren. How are you today? I'm good, Jared. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm excited to talk to you today because I read an article that you wrote on Police One quite a while ago, and I wrote down in my notes, talk to this guy. This is a great topic. It's I thought you really did a great job of unpacking, you know, what it meant and what was going on. And so so can you explain to me maybe just kind of a like a 30,000 foot view of what Munchausen syndrome by proxy is or was, whatever they call it now? Uh, well, it, it used to be called Munchausen by proxy. Munchausen uh, is, of course, a real serious mental health disorder. Mm-hmm. And now it's called, I, th- I think it's FDIA in the... Fictitious disorder imposed on another. Imposed on another. That's what I'm reading off my notes here, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's what that's what it actually is in the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that uh, mental health, mm-hmm. actual mental health professionals, not me, like just a nerd who, who enjoys <laughs> reading about it. That's what they that's what they use to to help diagnose uh, issues like this. But these folks are trying to draw attention to themselves by causing harm to another and then being able to come in and figuratively start a fire and then be the one who puts out that fire. So Munchausen, in the traditional sense, is just like a mother who will Mm -hmm. poison her child just to get attention because the child is sick. And she comes in and she's getting attention. She's outsmarting the doctor because the doctor can't figure out what it is when she knows exactly what it is. It doesn't always have to be a mother, but that's kind of the stereotypical example. Yes, we've, we've right? seen nurses. It's, it's happened in nurses. It's happened in nursing homes. Um, it happens in – Yeah, you have a patient right. that crashes, and they're the ones there to save it because they actually caused it. They yes, know. absolutely, because they know what's wrong, and they're the only one who can fix it. Yeah, and so – and I think I understood the attention-seeking aspect of that, but – Something that I didn't realize until I read your article and started doing some more research is is that there is that component of outsmarting the experts, of knowing the real cause when the smart people in the room, like the doctors, don't know. And I, I hadn't even considered that. That's so devious and wrong. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's just, I mean, it's a mental illness. Obviously, it's, it's, a, it's a bad thing, but, but I had... Man, it was even worse than I thought it was. You know, not only would you you cause harm to your child or to your patient, but but smokes. I mean, some of that's just like this weird power play over the smart people. Oh my goodness, I can't I can't believe someone would do that. And that's but, why it's so, so that's hard to detect. It's so hard to detect oh, yeah. because yeah. of that. Because it's such our normalcy bias just tells us nobody would do that. Yeah, yeah, you would think. One you would, would think. think. So what I love is that you found some people who had kind of talked about. This type of behavior moved over to the workplace, and you took that and ran with it and and developed an idea of what a what it would look like, not in a mother or in a nurse, but but in a manager in a workplace and specifically, you know, a police department. So so tell me what what that would be a munch a Munchausen manager. What is that? So in the office, you'll see a coworker who causes problems. 
and then they already have a plan on how to fix it because they started it. And then right. they'll come in and swoop in and fix it. And you'll see a lot of these folks that you might think uh, on, on police officers that you know get into these imaginary foot pursuits. Or mm-hmm. they'll start trouble with somebody so they can get in a fight with them. Uh, you might see yeah. a firefighter who starts fires. We've, we've actually seen those yeah. things. Okay. You know, in a regular workplace, as we talked about, it's hard to recognize. So what happens when those folks never get caught doing this because it's hard to catch them? Well, they're the ones that are always putting out fires, and all these people around them are just so dumb. They, every, this person just really stands out if you're not really paying attention. So what happens to yeah. them? They get promoted. Yeah. Well, they get to be the hero because they solved a problem, yeah. even though no problem would have occurred. Exactly. But they caused a problem, and then they got to solve the problem, and they get all the accolades and attention. And, Absolutely. And get the, reputation, get the reputation for being the one who puts out the proverbial fires. So, so I was trying yeah. to find this behavior somewhere, and there was no research on leadership issues with, with Munchausen that I could find. But it's hmm. so common, and I've seen it so many times in my, in my professional life, that – I really wanted to write this article so there could be something out there for someone, including yeah. the person who's afflicted and not just, you know, we, we, <laughs> forgiveness is a big thing. And part of that is understanding. And so I got a little piece at the end there, if you'll notice, that talks about if it's you, here's what you need to do. Yeah. So basically Munchausen is – Munchausen management in the law enforcement field, you're going to see somebody who will do anything to look good but doesn't actually help the organization or their people. So tell me, tell me how – someone gets started i mean let's let's just have this hypothetical police officer who feels this compulsion this need to get the attention what kind of ways might that start early on in a career like before they're in administration you know when they're when they're maybe just at the first level of being a supervisor what kind of ways could that play out as an fto or an acting sergeant what i've seen is uh withholding information resources I forget mm. forgetting to give things out in muster that would be very helpful, and then saying, "Yeah, I did. Why didn't you know that?" It, right. you know, it might be uh, stolen vehicle information. It might be literally giving a younger officer the wrong information about how to make an arrest or something like that. And then when they mess up, you go, "I had to go. I had to jump him there and stop him. He he did it again." They're creating supervisory work for themselves. Absolutely. You know, like, okay, I'm going to purposefully trip up this rookie yeah. so that I can be the one to come in and correct them. And I've seen it so many times. When the rookie might not have messed up. Right. Yeah. Just, doing what he, yeah. just doing what they thought was right. Which, you know, in fairness, you do need, you are responsible for your, for your own self. But if you call your sergeant, you're going to expect to get the right information or at least have yeah. them say, oops, I gave them the wrong information. But now that's – this is an intentional deal. This is a malicious yeah. act. Yeah. Yeah, they're undermining them on purpose. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is – and in, in law enforcement, think about how dangerous that is and how many terrible things happen because of that. So what happens when oh, the yes. sergeant keeps putting out these fires and keeps correcting all these dumb rookies that keep making these mistakes, and he's just so good at it. He just always seems to be there and always seems to catch them. Well, what do lieutenants and captains think? Yeah. <laughs> they think he's doing a great job. They might, they'll oh, they'll yeah. talk about him in the captain's meetings. You know, They'll talk about him with the chief and say, hey, this guy's doing a great job of catching these dumb kids. Yeah. I don't know what we'd do without him or her. You know, I hate it, too, because even though that dumb kid, that young rookie is is, you know, he's he's working at a deficit at the beginning of his career. But they overcome that pretty fast. I work with patrol officers and and boy, those rookies become seasoned veterans pretty quickly. Yeah. And and it's just a matter of a handful of years. And they are the ones who are the FTOs and getting promoted to sergeant, whatever. But that reputation that a Munchausen manager could put on somebody that, oh, I had to go back and I had to write them up and I had to correct them and I had to go out in the field and save their butt. Yep. That reputation could stick with them and prevent a promotion. And that's a morale killer. A lot of people think uh, they'll they'll call this supervisor, they'll call him like he's a headhunter. No, he's not just headhunting. He's doing more than that. He's actually causing these problems. So he has something to fix. And that's the terrifying part. So this Munchausen manager gets promoted and maybe promoted multiple times because he's cultivated a reputation for putting out fires. But in reality, he's the proverbial arsonist Correct. at the same time. Exactly. How does that mature or change? I mean, can you give me some examples as you, as you move up and you're not just a sergeant out in the street anymore, but now you're a lieutenant or a captain and you're doing more administrative kind of work? How does that Munchausen management evolve? 
Well, that's where it gets really scary because the higher up you go, the more you have control over finances, um, Hmm. budgets. So, I mean, what's the most important budget in a police department outside of personnel services? That's training, right? It's got to be training. Okay, yes. Yes, I say that because I'm a trainer. But it's it's absolutely true. That's the most important thing we can do for these folks is is give them training. That's one of them that never seems to have funding with these folks. Mm-hmm. But you'll see that funding go to uh, you know your citizen police academy or anything else that kind of shines a light, makes the department right. look good. Ironically, these people will also not tend to discipline someone for something that would go public. Such as because they don't want to look bad. Because they don't want to yeah. look bad. So the, a lot of those things will get swept under the rug. So if a cop gets a DUI or something, there's nothing you can do about that. It's already out there. But right. if they do something else internally, you'll see that get swept under the rug a little bit because that makes them look bad. So that's and right. you know you know how bad that is for morale when people are getting away with things they shouldn't that are doing bad things, but you're getting dinged over little stuff constantly that doesn't go out yeah. in public. So if you you know are late or if whatever that what you make a mistaken report or don't or make a bad arrest or don't and it's not that big of a deal then those will get punished but your bigger stuff that you see other guys doing and we might even use something like like a sexual harassment something mm-hmm. terrible like that that doesn't get anything done about it because that's going to go public and it would be embarrassing so so internally they're very heavy-handed yes. very authoritarian but anything that the public might be privy to they're they're more likely to cover it up and exactly. ignore it. Or okay, okay. Can you go back to talking about training? Can you spell out why would a Munchausen manager be hesitant or reluctant to get more training for their people? That is a good one. Um, you don't want people being better than you. So, as uh, a good leader, as a true leader, my lieutenant that works under me—I'm a captain. My lieutenant who works under me, my job is to train him for my job. I want him to be better at my job than I am when I leave. I want him to be able to walk right in there and do my job. Have some redundancy. Absolutely. And, and continuity. And, and that, that that's, kind of thing. that's for the organization. That's for your people who work for you. That's for morale. That's for everything. That's for the public. That There's no reason yeah. not to do that. Those folks aren't going to do that. They don't want you smarter than they are. And one particular place you'll see training be lacking with these kind of folks is leadership training. Because the mm-hmm. last thing – a Munchausen fellow wants somebody to do is recognize how poor their leadership is and recognize yeah. all the mistakes they're making. So every time, you know, let's say me, I would come back from a, from a school or a book that I read, I'd go, Hey, wait a minute. And start to pick up on some things. Well, they don't like that. And they sure don't like yeah. being told that. I'll tell you that for sure. <laughs> I'll tell you that firsthand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, they don't, they don't want, the people under them to to learn and to acquire the the leadership ability that would call them out and expose them for not being very good leaders. Absolutely, because a lot of their leadership reputation has been artificially generated. Exactly, it, it was it wasn't real leadership. It was stuff. It was false situations they created so that they could look good. And the higher they yeah. go, the worse it gets because the more obvious it becomes. There's more people working for them. At that point, and people won't recognize this exact thing. They'll think it's something else. They'll just say he does. He's he's crazy. You'll hear that a lot of times. That guy's yeah. just crazy. He's making these weird decisions. Well, now he's intentionally yeah. doing this. There is some alternative explanations. I really appreciated in your article that you brought up Hanlon's razor. Yeah, Hanlon's razor is something I quote all the time. You know, you don't ascribe to malice what can be explained by stupidity. <laughs> yeah. And 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 there are there are people who were really really good. It's what's called the Peter principle. They they were really good at one level, and because they were really good, they were the best SWAT officer ever. They get promoted to supervision, and they're not a good supervisor. That's a different skill set. Yep. And so some people are are mid career, and they are scrambling not because of mental illness, but because. They, they don't want to be exposed and, and they feel like they're a little bit over their skis and they're kind of outside of what they're comfortable with. And sometimes they just make dumb decisions. It's not necessarily malicious. How, how do you distinguish between, I mean, just in your own personal experience, again, we're not doctors, we're not trying to be the final authority. Absolutely. But, but how do you distinguish between somebody who's just messing up and they're not being a very good leader today versus somebody who is potentially pretty dangerous like this Munchausen manager. I, I would say look out for people who are disproportionately 
involved in those fires that we talked about. They're mm-hmm. always the one that comes up with the fire, and, and they're always the one solving it. Does, does it happen when they're not around? If they take a vacation yeah. week or two? And everything's smooth Is everything for two smooth weeks? and fine? <laughs> we've, had, we've had those administrators that when they're, when they're gone, nothing bad seems to happen. We always describe that yeah. to, well, they're just not nitpicking. No, they're not causing any problems. And so there aren't any problems there. You know, you get to the point where if there's not a problem, then they feel very useless and, and they have to have that. So kind of look out for that. They don't love team stuff. Really? They don't want help solving these problems. Explain that to me. Why, why would that be a problem? Okay, let's say Jared and, Jared and I are going to work on a problem that I started. What are the chances Jared's going to see Warren started that problem to begin with <laughs> when we start working <laughs> on it together? Right. I'll be like, no, I don't need help. Yeah. I know what I'm doing. I got this. I do this all the time. That kind of thing. Who's the office hero? And you might dislike him because of jealousy or whatever, but you really should look at that guy and think, you know – is that person – has he ever done stuff for the organization or is it always these little individual things? Does he, does yeah. he ever talk about the organization or the mission or service, that kind of thing? I think it will be obvious yeah. when, you, when you start to look at these things in detail and, and over time because everybody makes mistakes. I've been a terrible leader sometimes. I think sure, we all we have. have. I mean, yeah, and you're, and you're a yeah. chaplain. You, you've, I'm sure you've been, not been perfect. I'm sure you're better than I am, but I'm sure you have, no. you've made a mistake <laughs> here and there. <laughs> I, I have the advantage of not having to be in charge of anything important. Well, a, chap, so, a chaplain yeah. is a leader. You know, it's very much a leader. <laughs> yes, um, yes. And so and I, I enjoy talking to chaplains. My dad was a minister when I was a kid, and I always enjoyed that, uh, that aspect of it because you can, get a lot, you can get a lot out of that. And forgiveness is one of those things that – he was always preaching to me, literally mm-hmm. preaching to me. So, but yeah, just keep your eye peeled for, for those things. And of course, read the article. I don't want to give everything away. You right, need to read right. the article in place one. I'm sure you'll link that somewhere. I will. Yep. It'll be in the show notes. Uh, and as far as Hanlon's razor go, uh, one thing I did not include in that, that will be a chapter in my book. If I ever get it done is I also did, uh, I also referenced Heinlein's razor, which is okay. the same thing as that, you know, don't ascribe, Malice to something that could be easily explained with stupidity, semicolon, but don't rule out malice because <laughs> still, still could be there. What what is it? What is it about law enforcement culture that maybe even kind of produces or grooms people toward this kind of behavior? What why why does this pop up? Because I feel like everyone listening to this is like, oh, I know someone who's done this, and maybe it wasn't habitual, but they certainly felt they were victim of it at least once. So, so why does this kind of behavior come up so frequently? I think it comes up in every line of work. But think about what we want, uh, what, what we're trying to attract. What kind of folks are we trying to attract? We're trying to attract folks that, in their heart of hearts, they want to. They want to provide service, and, and that's an honor, and, and that, that should be at least one of your motivations, at least a big part of your motivation for being a cop. But we also are attracting people who want to drive fast and play with guns and chase bad guys, and yeah. you yeah. know, and and not, picture themselves. They picture themselves as heroes. Absolutely, you want to be a hero. Yeah. Everybody wants yeah. to save somebody. Yeah. Isn't that the greatest thing in the yeah. world? Is yeah. to, is to yeah. you know, even in peer support, I get so much out of that. Every time I help somebody just a little bit, it's it's a big deal, and you know. I hate to say there's no such thing as uh, as doing things for only the right reasons, but you know every every time you do something good, you feel good about it. There's a reason we do those things. So yeah. Yeah. I think it's got a lot to do with what we're trying to recruit. We're trying to recruit people who have to be advanced adults. But the funnest parts about the job, the most enjoyable parts, are kid stuff. And yeah. so it's yeah. it's a fine line to balance. And finding folks who can do both those things is a challenge. Mm-hmm. And we, you know, mm-hmm. you just got to press that press that service on them, you know, and, and just say, you yeah. know, do you say thank you when somebody serves you at a restaurant? Do you tip well? Because it's an honor to be served. And it's also an honor yeah. to provide service. And you really got to hammer those things home. And I know we're on a little tangent here, but it's a terribly important thing. Is there a way to provide leadership to our next generation? Because in law enforcement, the turnover happens really fast. I mean, today's rookies are tomorrow sergeants. And so, so how do we, how do we change the atmosphere so that we can reduce the number of people who fall into this trap and they start, you know, finding and creating fires to be put out? How, how do we prevent that? Is there a way to have more accountability? Is there a way to 
um, recruit better? I mean, what, what, where do you think would be the most effective way to help prevent some of this? Well, absolutely recruitment and background checks. We've had some folks slip through because we stopped using, uh, of course, we, everybody does MMPI, but it's not that difficult for people with uh, issues to get by an MMPI. The, uh, that's the mental health test for, for law enforcement. Mm-hmm. But personality inventories that are a little bit more modern, uh, like one called Impulse, it, it is very law enforcement specific, and it will tell you. And I went through and looked at some of the older ones that we had and some of the problem children that we've had, and it, it nailed it. It exactly said, mm-hmm. yes, this person is much more likely to use too much force. This person is likely to get complaints, and it's not you know, a yes or no. It's a scale. And those kind of things are terribly important. Those background checks, um, one of the big things that we're looking for, we have thankfully somewhat on staff. We have a licensed mental health professional who got a grant to work with us a certain amount of time. Well, he helped us kind of with our background investigators see what to look for. What, what are the two biggest things we're looking for other than a, a potential Munchausen, which is an offshoot of narcissism? We don't want n- clinical narcissists in, in our department. I don't mean I like to look at myself in the mirror or I think I'm good. I'm talking about a, an actual mental health. I was going to say that's tough. That's tough in a career field where everybody's <laughs> yes. pretty, pretty arrogant. And you've yeah. got to be, you've got, you've got to be <laughs> not just a little bit arrogant and not just a little bit, you know, I love myself, but a clinical narcissist to the point where right. you're, you're, you think everybody else is dumb and it's a serious problem. Right. And that's kind of, an, that's right. kind of where I think that Munchausen comes from. And then um, borderline personality disorder, those kind of things. We have to look for those. Well, he put us a little checklist yeah. together on things to look for. Actually, I worked with him on it. And so those are, those are terribly important things. Background checks can't be uh, – you can't be overlooked. It's important. And then when we're doing our leadership practice, you know, the first day I talk to him, I say, hey, this is tough. And uh, you're going to have to do some things that you don't like, and it's going to hurt. And I don't want to hear you complain about it, frankly. You know, um, and then we talk about service and we talk about, yeah. you know, obviously the things everybody has to talk about, the anti-harassment bias and all those, all those things we will not accept. But one of those things is I will not accept folks who are not service oriented. Like we were going to the store to pick up some supplies with rookies one time and the store clerk dumped a bunch of cans over, I mean, multiple cases of cans. And my three folks just stood there and looked at him and I said, what are you doing? And they jumped over there and started helping put it back together. Why would you not yeah. do that, guys? Yeah. So I think under, in, in showing them that service is important too, like we serve them. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a trainer that is internal service. I've turned that service away from the public as much as I'm serving my folks, and I've got to point that out to them. I think there's a lot of different ways. Just being a good leader is imperative, yeah. and, and weeding out the problems up front. We've had several of them that we picked up on what, uh-oh. This guy's not going to make it. And they would come and tell me this guy's not going to make it. And I'd say, well, what are we doing about it? You know, our, my trainers are saying this guy's going to be a problem. Well, like what? What's he doing? Are we documenting that? And then if we get enough documentation, he's going to be gone. So, yeah, there's. But that's so but that's so hard. It is so hard. Everybody is un, you know, undermanned. There's there's just so few recruits coming in and so few people that are sticking with it because you get people they get them trained up. You get them out on the street and then they quit. Yep. Uh, it, it, to to start throwing away other officers, especially ones who at least at a distance look pretty good, how 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 can you sell that? Let's say you're in the middle and and you're not executive leadership, but but you've got somebody that you just think there's a character problem here, mm-hmm. and you can't identify it. Their 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 record looks pretty good, but but you think there's actually an underlying problem. How do you even begin to approach that to the people above you? Well, I'll tell you what happens, and then I'll, then I'll tell you my answer. So the cycle, <laughs> if you don't mind me expounding, there, there's this cycle, and we saw it um, going back to the Rodney King, King incident, which is the, probably the first one you and I can remember as, as sure. re- moderately adult people. <laughs> old, old is the correct That's word for that. Yeah, seasoned, yeah. whatever. So we we can remember the Rodney King incident and how terrible that was and how bad that was. Not just that incident, but how terrible it was for law enforcement in general. And it's just like some things that have happened recently. You know, everybody gets mm-hmm. painted with the same brush, and that was a mm-hmm. horrible thing. So what happened to LAPD in particular is they lost a bunch of folks who were good, and they they got tired of being accused of doing bad things they hadn't they didn't do. They had nothing mm-hmm. to do with it. So they went to other departments. So L.A. lowered their standards, and they ended up lowering the background check, 
And, so, and they ended up with the L.A. Metro scandal. If you're not familiar with that, Google that up because it's a pretty terrifying deal. So that's terribly important that your bosses understand that. And having conversations about those things is, is important. Understand this is a cycle and we're going through it again and we don't want to be part of that. So we don't want to lower those standards, at least not too much. There's some things like tattoos mm-hmm. and that kind of thing that we've lowered, which aren't as important. But, you know, physical right. standards, maybe we facial can. Facial hair. Yeah, facial like hair, not, you know, goatees, yeah. uh, that kind of thing. Maybe yeah. not as important as we used to think they are. Physical standards are important. Uh, character is, is imperative. It's imperative. So once we identify that, it, it's imperative that we start documenting it. And I'll tell you, the best thing you can do is have a conversation and then follow it up with an email because emails are forever. Yes. And yeah. if your department allows it. And you're saying an email up to executive up leadership? Up to the person you just talked to. Like you went to your boss and you say, per our conversation, I wanted to make sure that I, wanted to make sure that I explain this correctly. Or per our conversation, I did this, that, and the other. Is there anything else you'd like me to do? There's nothing unprofessional or impolite or insubordinate about that. However, now it's documented. So if that boss just happens to be one of those Munchausen leading folks, they can't do anything about that. And I would take, and uh, assuming it was, it's within your policy, if you've got a a cloud-based service like Dropbox or something, you can print those to PDF and upload them right from your chair, and ha- and yeah. have those there. It's an open record, and if you really, if that's not within your policy, you can always go get them within three years in most states. Go pay your your fifty cents and go get that email and have it there for your mm-hmm. records. If that's not within policy, you can always get it that way. It's real hard for them to to lie about those things and to, and to cover them up. So that'd be the one thing I would do about that is just keep documenting it, keep bringing it up. And then it's not your, it's not on you at that point, and they don't want to be embarrassed, right. so they will likely go along with it. And we've, I've not had trouble lately. I used to have a lot of trouble with this with with former personnel that I worked for, but lately we don't have that problem anymore. Um, my chief, <laughs> we had one a while back, and I went to the chief and, and I said, "Do you want me to take care of it?" He goes, "No, bring me to my office. I'll take care of it." I talk to a lot of cops around the country, and I feel like I see a pattern where you. You shine a light on it. You document things really well because you're seeing a problem. And you pass that up to a manager who might be a Munchausen manager. And the exposure, the you know, shining a light on it, forces them to do the right thing. But then they are surly and grumpy and out of sorts about it. I mean, like they're really bothered that they were forced to do the right thing. And that's bad news. But I think the good news is it seems like if you can wait them out, they'll just take a job somewhere else. They'll they'll go into the civilian world. They'll retire. They'll they'll whatever. And and sometimes that experience, which was doing the right thing, was so unpleasant to them that 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 will sometimes push them push them out. And I don't know if that that that's any kind of guarantee, but I feel like that is a pattern that I'm seeing. Because people will come and complain to me like, oh, my goodness, you wouldn't believe what's happening over here in my department. This this guy's impossible to work for. But then a year later, that guy had left. And so so I feel like it's something that you can endure if 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 at all possible. I wish mine, <laughs> there, there might be light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, I wish mine had been only a year. I, I will give a warning. <laughs> I will warn you that uh, doing the right thing is uh, is is never easy. You can always tell which one's the right yeah. road because it's the hard one. And yeah. if you've got somebody who is yeah. very entrenched in this behavior, they might stay for years and years and years and just push uh, you literally as far away from them as they can get and figuratively yeah. as far away as they can get. Because they can't justify you know, whistleblower kind of stuff. They can't justify that. But there's always a right. reason right. why you, know, you need to be somewhere else or in some other division that you don't want to be in. And right. it will seem perfectly normal to people who aren't seeing it for what it is. But – don't ever be ashamed of doing the right thing. Exactly. Uh, you know, you might it might it might hurt. You might have to suffer for it. It's just the way doing the right thing is. I mean, we all know yep. that Frequently. every one of us has had to pay for doing the right thing at some point, and especially yep. when you got people around you who don't want to do the right thing. And like I say, it's yep. always easy to tell <laughs> which one's the right choice. It's the one you don't want to do. It's the one that's hard. Yeah, but I also wonder too if maybe you know, in kind of grand picture. If, if this isn't what you're meant to do, I mean, I'm, I'm certain, yes, you're meant to go catch bad guys and put them in jail, but maybe you're also meant to apply a certain amount of uh, positive, unselfish pressure to help 
reform your department and make your department a healthier and happier place to work. And and that that is a gift to countless officers who are going to be coming behind you. I mean, it may not be pleasant for you, but it's it's life changing for them. And so I, I I hope that maybe someone could see it see it that way. I, I just heard my dad talking through you. Uh, my dad passed away and <laughs> my dad passed away in nineteen. But that's that's some of the thing some of the things he told me too was you know you you know you're doing the right thing and you know you're making a positive impact and I can see it. I don't know if anybody else understands it or sees it, but I, I can yeah. see the things that are different. And, but but boy, if you if you got into it for personal attention, I mean that's what we're talking about. Is is people who got into law enforcement for the wrong reason? Yep. They wanted the personal attention. They wanted the accolades, and when they couldn't get it naturally, they had to artificially create it. That was wrong. It's unethical, and that's not why you became a cop. Exactly. Well, fantastic, Warren. I I appreciate this so much. I really appreciate uh, you you know having the courage to write on a what could be a pretty sensitive topic there there are munchausen managers who do not want your article to be read and do not want this podcast to be listened to oh i was i was worried about it <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think any of the bosses that the, the folks that i was talking about at the time who are now gone who are now uh, happily retired and i i love that the fact that they're enjoying their retirement and uh, all that <laughs> but uh, i'm working on that forgiveness thing but uh, yeah, I really appreciate yeah. the chance to uh, that, that Police One gave me to put this on there because it, it wasn't something that they wanted to do right away because it is controversial and it is negative. And yeah. it, it, it's, yeah. it's necessarily negative. And I try, to, I try to make as much positive out of those things as I can. So like at the yeah. end of the article, you'll, 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 hear me, you'll hear me talk about, okay, this isn't some evil monster, this green monster that we're talking about. We're talking about a human being who's got a mental health problem. And maybe mm-hmm. somebody's reading this and thinking, yeah, 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 I know that guy. And then they read the last article and think, or last paragraph or two, and say, hey, maybe it's me. You yeah. know, which is something we're, not, yeah. which is something we humans are not really good about doing. Like, no, are, no, we can see the other person's you know, problem. Yeah. Maybe yeah. it's <laughs> me, and that's something that I had to learn to say every occasion. Like, why are these people so stupid? And then I have to, say, oh, well, hold on a second. <laughs> yeah, you know, maybe it's yeah. me. So at, at the end, I talk about a little bit about yeah. just. Um, what to do about it for yourself? Have some self forgiveness. Have have some introspection, which is another article I wrote that I think is I yeah. think is important for leadership. Yeah, be willing not to take all the credit or even get any of the attention. Yeah, exactly. It's going to happen sometimes. You need to learn to be okay with I it. I tell you what, there's no yeah. better feeling than than to give all the accolades to your folks under you, and they yeah. obviously yeah. they love it. But there's no better feeling than to stand back and watch watch them get the attention, the accolades that they deserve, yeah. even though you may have led yeah. the whole thing, watching them get attention and, yeah. and, and awards even. Yeah, it's the very height of leadership to have your protege outshine. Absolutely. You know, to, to teach somebody and have them excel even and go to greater heights than you ever went. That, that's, that's a, that made you a really great leader. Yeah. But it's hard. Our ego gets in the way, and especially if we have an unhealthy you know, maybe a, a mental health issue uh, affecting that ego. That's that's a that's the danger, and that's something we can be looking out for. But what I love about cops is that they run toward difficulty. Yep. And so, so this is hard. This is difficult, whether it's in you or in somebody else. But but that's that's what makes you special is that you you run toward that. When you have that 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 protege that 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 person you've been mentoring all this time who is as good or better than you at that topic you got two choices number one you're gonna love it you better love it because it's gonna it's happening if you're doing your job yeah Yeah. yeah, yeah. so you need to learn more that you can teach him or go to a different topic and become an expert in that topic and bring somebody else up or bring them up or whoever always be bringing somebody up with you it's a fantastic feeling and it's the only thing that got me through some of the rough times at work is being able to reach out and and give that to somebody else, you know, try to, because yeah. if you're a book nerd and you're not sharing that information, you might as well just be a library somewhere because nobody's going to use it, you know? <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Well, Warren, thank you so much. I really appreciate the work you did on this, and uh, I hope a lot of people benefit from listening to you. I appreciate you having me so much. I love that I had Warren Wilson's name and Police One article in my notes for two and a half years. And then it actually worked out for us to have this conversation. He gives me the impression that if we had been at the same department, we would have been great friends. And probably the best thing about doing a podcast is getting to meet cops like this. Thank you, Warren, for being on the show. Please check out the show notes. There you'll find a link to Warren's article and other information as well. 
When you read his article, make sure you leave a comment to tell Police One what a great job he did identifying something that almost every cop has encountered, but few are able to recognize. And remember, before you go and diagnose every bad manager with a mental illness, Hanlon's Razor says, never attribute to malice what can be adequately explained by stupidity. So not every leadership mistake that you're going to encounter makes the person evil or certifiable. On the next episode of Hey Chaplin. What is the attraction? Why do people put themselves in this spot to be married to a police officer? People ask that so often. I think I think there's lots of things. Uh, overall, law enforcement officers in general are caring, they're compassionate, they're giving, they, they put others first. Like there's so many good characteristics that are pre-screened <laughs> by the hiring process. Yeah, um, yeah. I joke with my husband as well that he also passed drug screening and a psychological <laughs> exam. Um, so I knew <laughs> that there was some good right there. Um, we joke about that a lot. But I think that the characteristics that make a good cop also make a good spouse. They really do. And so that is very attractive. This show is commercial free because listeners who feel like they've received some value from Hey Chaplin return the favor by buying me a virtual coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash heychaplin. You don't have to do that, but thank you. It means the world to me. The views expressed here are the personal views of the host and our guest and do not necessarily represent the views of any law enforcement agency or its components. If you like this episode, please share it with a cop or someone who loves a cop. Thank you for listening to Hey Chaplin. And as always, pray for peace in our city. No, really, you should actually do it. You should share the episode with everyone you know. Go to the app, pause the show, hit the little three dot ellipsis button, push the button that says share episode, and then send that link to everybody in your group chat right now. It's okay. I'll wait. Ah, there. Don't you feel better now? Thank you and have a great day.